Hillary, I'm not able to start my video. Um, thank you very much. Welcome everyone to Pilates Applications for Health Conditions. This is the monthly handspring webinar series that um, focuses on the forthcoming book, which is co-edited by Madeline Black and Elizabeth Larkham. Our guest today is John Howard Steele, the author of Caged Lion. Before the introduction uh, to John and the discussion with him, um, I would just like to uh, give some guidelines for how to participate in the, this morning's webinar, today's webinar. The webinar will be for, for one hour. Um, Hillary, may we have the how to participate slide. The webinar will be for one hour. You can expect about uh, 30 minutes of uh, discussion, including John Howard Steele reading from his book, The Caged Lion. Um, we welcome your questions and ask that you please submit your questions in the, in the Q&A area. At the last 15 minutes of the webinar, we'll take your questions. And just to assure you that if there are more than uh, have time for in the hour, then we're happy to go another 10 minutes uh, following the hour. Um, the chat will be open during this webinar, so uh, feel free to, uh, to comment in the chat. However, just to remind you that since the webinar is being is streaming live on YouTube and of course being recorded, um, that anything you put in the chat will become part of the um, document. Um, following the discussion with John, there will be a, a movement demonstration and practice that's relevant to the assessment that Madeline Black and I developed for our forthcoming book, Pilates Applications for Health Conditions. Now, an introduction to John Howard Steele and also a, uh, to put his, his expertise in the context of this webinar. In co-editing the book, <laughs> in co-editing the book, Pilates Applications for Health Conditions, Madeline Black and I are very aware of the history of uh, contrology and the history of Joseph Pilates and his uh, um, dream, his vision to include uh, Pilates in, um, for health conditions. John Howard Steele has been practicing law for 60 years and practicing Pilates for nearly as long since he became a student of Joseph Pilates early in his law career in New York City. Um, John Howard Steele is one of the few people who studied with and knew Joseph Pilates both in and out of his studio. Consequently, he's in a unique position to tell his story. And we're so grateful that uh, John Steele has, uh, is available to join us today in order to give a a very unique and never heard before window into the, uh, the vision that Joseph Pilates had uh, for his system of contrology. John Steele, welcome to um, the webinar. Well, well, thank you, Elizabeth. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, this is, you know, about more than uh, in 1963 or even in uh, 1967 when Joe died, the thought that this would occur was in no one's mind, I can tell you that. So uh, this is really wonderful. Yeah. John, would you set the stage um, uh, so we have some context for the passage that you're prepared to read from your book? regarding the, uh, the vision that Joseph Pilates had for the inclusion of contrology in healthcare? Sure. Uh, 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 the passage I'm going to read is part of the chapter where I am at the uh, Lenox Hill Hospital, uh, where Joe has been taken uh, a few days before before this, he's been in there three or four days. He is very, very sick. 
Uh, he has uh, emphysema and he uh, has pneumonia and he's lying in an oxygen tent, uh, which in those days was a, a kind of a plastic, uh, a clear plastic covering over the whole bed and he's full of tubes and wires. And he's been lying there for three or four days and I arrived and I've been visiting him every day. And I arrived at the hospital, uh, I think this was in the afternoon of a Sunday. Uh, Clara had just left and I was just sitting next to him uh, with my hand just, uh, kind of uh, snuck under the, the uh, oxygen tent holding his just on top of his hand and he was lying uh, looking up the ceiling and uh, uh, very calm but he started to talk uh it it was uh, it started out to be a ramble uh, he was having a lot of trouble breathing you know, a lot of punctuation of his talk uh, just to take a breath uh, and I was trying at that time to kind of calm him down, but he wouldn't. He just kept uh, rambling on. And uh, he came back to the topic that he had been talking to me about for years, which was his deep-seated resentment and hatred of the medical profession for ignoring him. And uh, he was completely convinced that, uh, uh, probably way overly convinced that uh, contrology, which is what he called it then, uh, would uh, cure everything, everything. And, and his theory was that, uh, uh, that uh, doctors refused it because uh, it would put them out of business because there wouldn't be anyone to fix anymore. So, uh, uh, excuse me, I just had to turn off my phone. So that was the setting. I was sitting there. I I kind of knew that that he was finished, although I had no medical. Uh, uh, assurance of anything the doctors uh, wouldn't talk to me because I, I was in the family. But anyhow, here's the uh, uh, paragraph that I'd like to read about that. Uh, and I'll start here. But like the Energizer Bunny, he just kept going. Joe talked to the ceiling of his oxygen tent. He spoke about the several letters he wrote to the Surgeon General of the United States, with whom he had a contact through a client. He promised he could help President Eisenhower fully recover from his heart attack. He couldn't believe his letters went unanswered. Joe talked about trying to present his system to the orthopedic societies in New York. He was never invited to make a presentation, which infuriated him. He told me he begged ballet dancers whom he had fixed to tell their ballet company doctors about his methods and gain an audience for him. Nothing came of that. He insisted, like a Baptist preacher, if everyone did chondrology, there would be no disease, no stress, and no war. Mankind, according to Joe, had a whole new enemy, the stress of the modern world. Doctors couldn't fix that. He could. Joe's anger was still there as he pushed words out, a good sign, even if muted by his breathing difficulties and muffled by the oxygen tent. That's... Uh, well, that's how he was at that moment. And it was the last uh, full day of his life. Okay. 
Yes. Madeline? Oh. Yes. Um, I'd like to read, um, John, a passage. Um, we're really interested in hearing about Mr. Pilates' approach uh, with contrology, specifically towards people who you know, had a health condition or an injury. Uh, so you wrote, uh, a bedrock of Joe's reputation and his business was his skill, a talent, really, at healing energy. His uncanny instinct led him to the source of the problem, which he corrected with contrology, augmented by specific exercises. He would listen to your complaint impatiently, put you on the Cadillac or reformer, have you move as directed, and then without a word, without a diagnosis, without touching you, ask you to do a few more movements. Then he would tell you what to do at home, and that was it. So what I found very interesting in reading your book was the fact that a person would come in like yourself and have a physical complaint very specific. My neck hurts, my back hurts, something like this. And I'd love to hear your experience of your first session and how what I got from reading your book is that Joseph Pilates was a master at looking at how the body moved. And then through his system was, be, was able to direct you, whether he was touching you or verbally cueing you to move you through your body in a way to release what needed to be released and strengthen what needed to be strengthened without actually working on that specific site. Yeah, uh, that was the uh, uh, the most remarkable thing uh, for me. Uh, I I went to him reluctantly. Uh, my mother was very enthusiastic. I'd been to him for a few years. My mother and father both, and uh, um, and my parents got very enthusiastic about everything we would now, I guess, call new age. And I thought this was just another one of their uh, uh, things to do. And, uh, but I had a chronic stiff neck. I'd had it for years and years and it would come and go, but it was very severe when I had it. And I'd have to walk like this for a while and then two or three days later, it'd go away. But it, it was very uh, disturbing and uncomfortable. And my mother kept saying, oh, you have to go to this this man on the west side, Joseph Pilates, he fixes everybody. He's, and I just thought it was absolutely nuts. But I went, finally, um, more to uh, get rid of her annoyance than fix my neck. I had no confidence that anyone could do anything about it and had been to orthopedists. Anyhow, uh, when I met him and saw him, and I've described that at length in the book, which was a shock uh, in the first place. He was just wearing hardly anything. It was a rather cool New York morning. And uh, uh, he, I tried to tell him why I was there. He had no interest whatsoever. He told me to go change. I changed, he told me to, to sit down on the machine uh, that I, I've never seen anything like that in my life or anything like this. Jim, anyhow, he, he never once in the first session or any time after uh, uh, made any mention of the fact I had a stiff neck. But the fact is, when he sat me down and I worked through the uh, uh, I guess the classic uh, reformer routine by the time and he would tell me to do a few things move your left foot a little bit here on the foot bar drop your shoulder do this do that but not very many instructions but he watched me with an intensity that uh, it, it's hard to describe that intensity. He was totally focused on me. And uh, 
when I left, I, I was a mess, but I knew, uh, uh, my body knew that that problem was over, and it was. Mm -hmm. One shot. John, John, would you okay, read the, uh, the, the would you read the second passage that you marked? Uh, I uh, uh, yes, so that was the walking passage that you wanted, Elizabeth. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, Sorry, Madeline. I thought there was one before the walking passage, uh, which is the one about sitting on the reformer with the instructions. Yes, yeah. I was just gonna. I was just gonna oh. mention that. All right. And, yeah. Fantastic. So what? What? So John, what I want to um, talk to you about is how Joseph just didn't take you through a whole bunch of movement the very first time, and it progressed as you showed up, and that you spent quite a bit of time just learning how to stand and sit. And then and once that, you actually achieved the, the standing and sitting, then he had you do the next step and then the next step until you were really efficient with your movement. Uh, yes, that's ex exactly, uh, uh, exactly right. I mean, what happened uh, was when, you know, he sent me in the change and changing in those, well, it's all in the book, but I, I came out shirtless. Uh, men didn't wear shirts, uh, wearing little trunks. And uh, uh, he told me, kind of pointed, he, he was very uh, economical with words. I mean, that's the but only What I, I really appreciated about that passage, John, was your experience of describing physically what you were doing but at the same time you give us an insight into your to your mind about this is crazy this is not exercise like all yeah. the little things going on in your head and as teachers today we still have clients like that when we first get people come seeing us and we're taking them through this more trying to teach them how to move in their body based on what we're seeing they that I can tell they're thinking the same thing as you. This is not exercise. I because you had a preconceived idea of what exercise was, and this was so radically different for you. A absolutely, Madeline. I mean, the, the first shock, of course, was seeing him out in the hall, and uh, 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 you know he was uh, 80, 81 or two at that time. And it was this barrel chested, very deeply tanned, uh, sort of short man, uh, short, it's somewhat shorter than I am. I don't think that short, but, uh, and he, a, a very, uh, his stance was very, very aggressive, very boxer like. He was leaning in, as they say now, had, nothing to say to me uh, hardly a hello and i uh, you know i was in a state of shock from the moment i s first saw him and i was like what the hell am i doing here and uh but i i, it, I was one of them, i still am one of those people that uh, uh, uh finish things they start so I, I i went along i changed I, I, when I walked in the room, the, the gym, you know, the studio, uh, and I saw this equipment, it, I mean, I, it's exactly uh, what you say, Madeline. I, I, you know, I had no uh, connection to that. Exercise was barbells in those days. There weren't any of the fancy machines you see in, uh, in spas and gyms now. And I said, what are all these things? It was all very neatly laid out, beautifully uh, clean and smelled of Lexol and uh, three-in-one oil, uh, but it was just completely bizarre. And he sat me down on a reformer and uh, again, I had no idea what was ahead of me, what I was doing there, and I had all these things in my mind, And but that's when he started to take over. He, he literally took over my whole thinking process, and what he did basically, when I think about it now, 
is he stopped me from thinking. He just mm -hmm. absolutely cut off <laughs> that part of my nervous system and made me pay 100% of my attention to him. And uh, so that's where we started. He, I came out of the room. Uh, you feel a little funny uh, just walking around in, uh, in shorts in, in, in inside New York. But there I was, and there he was. So when there was no one else. But you have a out. sense, though, that as even though he wasn't a man of many words, you, you had a sense that he was watching almost like every cell of your body moving. And, and like and in the moment, just really being able to analyze what you're doing in order to guide you through the movement, like watching uh, you walk. It, so I, yeah, go ahead. Yes, he what I, I describe in the book. Even my first handshake with him, he was taking my pulse. I mean, mm. I, and I knew he was taking my pulse. He was looking me up and down, was if I was applying for a job to be a waiter in a three-star Michelin restaurant. He, he was checking everything out about me and, and that never stopped. I mean, for years, never ever stopped. His attention to, to you, the student, or the customer or the client was was uh, uh, no one pays that kind of attention to you when you go to your doctor you would want your doctor to do that but they don't and he watched every little movement you made that said nothing no facial expression no response whatsoever but his focus his concentration was amazing and that's what in fact now that i think about it years and years later got me to go back the second time mm -hmm. that there was someone on earth that would pay that kind of attention to my me my body it yeah your body right it yeah so just, what what i want to um move into um the gate the walking that you did with him uh in the park um, Elizabeth and I, in our book, um, Pilates Applications for Health Conditions, uh, each of the authors uh, are doing the same assessment that she and I developed. And Elizabeth and I uh, wanted to, quote, kind of update the Pilates um, teacher's way of assessing people because most of the time we're taught a static uh, assessment, like just stand there, the shoulders higher, this, you know, your foot's dropped. And things like that. And the teachers aren't necessarily taught how to see movement. And Joe was about, from what I understood from your book, about being able to really tune in and watch movement and then be able to guide from there. So we used GATE as, a, as the basis of the assessment. And I found it fascinating that we're actually not updating, we're bringing it back you know, <laughs> into the Pilates training because could you read the part when you were walking in the park with him uh, yeah, and, this, he, and his this, analysis, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, this is walking on 8th Avenue, which is the street on which uh, his gym was uh, located. And uh, he, he would just suddenly grab me uh, at the end of a session or I would come over later in the afternoon uh, actually in, uh, to have uh, dinner with uh, both of them, uh, Clara and Joe. And he would just say, let's go for a walk. And he would grab me. And he, he uh, had a very European style of walking, which was uh, arm in arm, uh, which was unusual on 8th Avenue to see that in New York. Anyhow, it's very usual all over the rest of the world, but not there. And the other thing about it, was that I was there in my fancy lawyer clothes with my uh, you know, tie on and jacket or coat and hat sometimes. Um, uh, and he was in his shorts, uh, sometimes with a turtleneck, long sleeve turtleneck shirt, uh, always with a shirt. I don't think he went out without a shirt, but it, it was tight fitting. And he was wearing his little canvas uh, ballet practice shoes. 
And here we were, this 80 some year old man and this 30 year old preppy kind of uh, dude in, in his clothes walking down the street. And it almost looked like he was prying me along. Uh, so that's the setting for this. It was very difficult for me to keep up with him. And part of the walk was assessment, to use the word uh, you did. He, he was not only assessing me, he was teaching me how to walk properly. So uh, it, it was, and that, and he would talk to me. All right, so I started in the book. It was during these walks that Joe would talk almost always about something related to contrology. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we walked along, he would correct my walking posture and style. He'd tell me to put my shoulders back, but not up, and my chin down, but not droopy. And because we were arm in arm with his hand on my wrist, he fully controlled our pace and forced me to walk evenly. It felt to me like I was on a treadmill having a cardiac stress test. Now, uh, uh, I'll go on. Not only would he fix my walking posture, but he had comments about everyone who passed by. To Joe, People on New York sidewalks were specimens of bad bodies and bad physical habits. Everyone needed some correction, and contrology would fix them in a jiffy. See that lady over there? She has her head at a tilt, and that is because she takes a longer step with one foot, which causes her to put that hip forward, and that requires her to tilt her head to keep balance. One day, probably already, she will have a bad back. And then uh, she will go to a doctor who will tell her that she had a curved spine and sell her a brace and give her a big bill. Two weeks with me, I'm the reformer in Cadillac and the bad back will be gone and her head will be straight when she walks. Someone else would come into view and Joe would say, that man over there must be a hairdresser or a golfer or a dentist because he swings one arm uh, very loosely and the other one sort of hangs like it's tired out. One day his shoulder will start to get stiff and hurt and he will go to a doctor who will give him some pills which cost money. He will take the pills and the pain will go away for a while. And he will take more pills and his stomach will get back. And who knows what will happen to him. Two weeks in the gym every day, he can fix his shoulder, learn to swing the arms the same. And then just two times a week, he stays fine. No doctor, no pills, no pain. Very easy. And that was Joe. It's incredible. It's incredible you could, your memory also, and your not being a body, not being a teacher, the fact that you could even write that, you know, from your memory in such, where the movement people, the, we know the biomechanics and we can totally visualize what's going on in those two people's bodies just from your words. So I'm really impressed in that writing, John. It's great work. Well, it, it really stuck when you are uh, being dragged along 8th Avenue at rush hour. I also described how he crossed streets. <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> it was such a graphic, crazy, crazy thing for me to be doing. It, it never left. In fact, if, if yeah. I go back to New York and I go on 8th Avenue, it pops right back into my yeah, You've just changed. Next time I'm in New York and walking on 8th Avenue, I'm going to have a whole other view. But I do the yeah. same thing. I am constantly, when I'm walking or at the airport, you know, you have all these bodies and you just can't help but observe and notice these things. So it was really uh, very heartful to, to hear you describe that, to say, yes, we, we are actually carrying on that kind of work, you know, through, you through sure are. To see movement yeah. and help people. Yeah, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah. okay.
So I, I could you speak, I I'm curious if uh, you witnessed anyone while you were there at the studio during your sessions, if you saw anyone who had a really serious health condition or injury or, you know, that, that uh, you had any experience of him doing something maybe different, you know, with that person. Um, did you witness anything like that? Uh, not really, because the 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 culture of the studio was you were all alone there, even if it was jammed with people. Uh, you couldn't talk to anyone, couldn't look at anyone. I mean, you could look at them, but you couldn't watch them. Uh, you were you were very much in your own world. Uh, you were trying very hard to get through the routine by yourself, which he insisted upon. And uh, people would come in and, and uh, come, uh, you know, but you, you never paid any attention. I mean, I've heard stories. Uh, uh, Mary Bowen, I think, has told me stories about he, he would take uh, certain people to another room. Well, there was no other room in that studio, so it must have been next door to his apartment. But I never, no, I never saw him, I never saw him uh, uh, deal with anyone any differently than anyone else. Uh, so, yeah, so he but, really no. had that whole, whole body uh, approach that regardless of your complaint, like you said, he would listen but not pay any attention to your complaint and he would look at the body as a whole and know that as I'm working on improving the efficiency of the movement in your body whatever your complaint is is going to be resolved yeah I mean he he, he that's exactly what he did he watched you very carefully when he came in he watched you very carefully when you left and I'll tell you a little other little thing. I don't know if I even had it in the book, but I think I do. The reformer of Joe's days had the four wheels under the sliding carriage. It just had four up and down casters. They were commercial hardware casters and they ran on a rail. Uh, and it, if that, and now the reformers have wheels that are not only a, a vertical, but there's a horizontal wheel to mm -hmm. keep it centered. But he didn't have that wheel. And if, if you didn't push the caster evenly, like we're now doing legwork at the beginning, if you didn't push it evenly, it, it got a little off center in in the frame and it would squeal so uh it and that was a thing for him uh, symmetry and using your muscles evenly throughout your whole body was a, a very crucial point of his of, of contrology and clara who could hardly see she could be completely across the studio. She would hear that squeal and she would be over next to you in a second, either telling you to move your foot on the foot bar or push evenly. It, 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 she, he had all these tricks, I would say, clues to see where you were not using your body evenly. If you were doing uh, leg circles, on the carriage and you didn't bring your legs down evenly. This is a simple little thing, right? Put your legs up, swing them. If you didn't bring them down evenly, the carriage would go a little out of center. You'd hear a squeal or it'd get stuck or you'd feel it stuck and it corrected you because you had to move it back and forth on these four wheels mm -hmm. uh, without the side protection that we've added uh, since. But all these things were designed, and let me tell you, he never discussed this. He didn't tell me this. You just picked it up. Designed 
so that whatever movement you made uh, where he wanted you to make it symmetrically, you had to make it symmetry. It didn't work otherwise. It was yeah, that's a great tool for teaching proprioception. <laughs> so yeah, you had to have your body proprioception in order to know which way you're pulling and to keep that carriage in the center. And so he was really also by having you consciously do that and not being told to do that, it was also a very deep like nervous system training, not just your muscles and things. Well, you know, Ron Fletcher at one point uh, had a lot of uh, difficulty. He had some personal difficulty with Joe, but uh, uh, Ron at one point said something about you, you teach people and you train animals, but in a way he was training you. He, he was, you, you suffered it wasn't pain when you got stuck on the reformer, but it was a, 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 a nudge. It was something, a, a choke collar on the dog, a little, you know, that, oh, I shouldn't be doing that or I'm doing something wrong. You know, when you play music and you- Yeah, so it's like in your brain, we, ha we have that part of our brain, you know, that deep animal part of us, that's still with us, even though we're people. So to sure. get the training at that level, uh, you know, in your nervous system is a very deep, powerful way of training. Uh, I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah, that's that really was, interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's really one of the things about contrology and Pilates that is, is, is unique, mm -hmm. this trick. Thank you, that was fantastic. Thank you, John. So um, we're going to do uh, an, a little bit of an assessment movement piece um, now. Um, Madeline, there, yeah. there's the uh -huh. uh, there's the the bringing Joe's vision into the present um, present day, and okay. um, so for that I have the slides from St. Francis Hospital. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, sorry. The, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, then. Super interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, um, John, you mentioned that um, that on his uh, deathbed that Joseph Pilates was in. Uh, was in conversation with you about his vision, his vision for um, for how contrology could be so beneficial to healthcare and for a number of health conditions. So I have prepared some slides uh, that bring us um, 17 years after Joseph Pilates passed away. Um, in a way, his uh, his dream, his vision. Uh, started to be realized um, because at St. Francis Memorial Hospital on, uh, as you see on Hyde Street in San Francisco, a, a major a downtown hospital. Um, in 1983, uh, the hospital invited Dr. James G. Garrett, an orthopedic surgeon, MD, to start a sports medicine center you can see in this um, headshot of Dr. Would you go back, Hillary, please? You can see in this headshot of Dr. Garrick in the um, what would be the upper left-hand corner behind his head. Those are that's actually a poster in dance medicine of Nureyev's uh, feet in uh, fifth position. So not only did Dr. Garrick start Center for Sports Medicine, but he also specified that there would be a dance medicine division. Okay, then the next slide, Hillary. And it was in 1984 that this comprehensive dance medicine center under the direction of Dr. Garrick uh, was designed to diagnose, treat and rehabilitate persons with dance related injuries and associated concerns. Now, um, Dr. Garrick was the physician for San Francisco Ballet, for Oakland Ballet, for um, ODC, a variety of um, dance companies uh, in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. He also provided medical treatment for the, uh, the artists who were uh, visiting in the musical theater shows, Cats, etc., that came through town. Um, Dr. Garrick had become uh, acquainted with the work of Joseph Pilates because, uh, next slide please, because he attended a, um, Dr. Garrick attended a dance medicine conference in Los Angeles 
where I believe Diane Severino of the Ron Fletcher Company was demonstrating um, the efficiency of Pilates apparatus work for dancers with injuries. Um, Diane Severino was, uh, was a, an instructor at uh, Cal Institute of the Arts, I believe, as well as at the Ron Fletcher Company. So Dr. Garrick um, asked one of his patients who was a principal dancer of Oakland Ballet, Patrice Whiteside. He invited her to start the Dance Medicine Center in conjunction with him and the staff of physical therapists, including Chris Capra Fitzsimmons. This is, a, uh, this is a photo of the dance medicine area, which was uh, staged uh, for the, at then, at that time, the current concepts Pilates Equipment Company, their first brochure and current concepts founded by Ken Endelman became Balance Body. Next slide, please. Did you mention you were in the picture, Elizabeth? <laughs> well, John, um, uh, thank you for that acknowledgement. Yes, thank you. Yes, that's the same photo that's that's in your book, as a matter of fact. Yes. It sure, it sure is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it's, uh, I find it fascinating to trace how, or to track, um, to track how is it that, uh, that the work that John experienced in Joe's gym, Joe's gymnasium, how did that make its way to a, um, a downtown hospital in San Francisco? Here we have the first page of an article from Dance Magazine in February 1956 they all go to Joe's. And that is uh, that Joe's groundbreaking work, as John mentioned in his book, in which he could fix a number of dancers, Eve Gentry, Carola Trier, Ron Fletcher, uh, Ramona Krasinowska. Next slide, please. Um, that, could, uh, that would all uh, lead to the fact that dancers became aware of the value and the efficacy and the efficiency, the magic of Joseph Pilates' work. And it was their interest that led Pilates into dance medicine and to Dr. Garrick. This is an article from 1988 in Dance Teacher Now um, explaining the Pilates technique. I believe this was written by an instructor at the uh, Ron Fletcher Company in Los Angeles. Next slide. And it was in uh, 1988, a few uh, years after uh, James Garrick and Patrice Whiteside had founded the Dance Medicine Division of Center for Sports Medicine, that we hosted a, a professionals forum. Now we had to call it a professionals forum because at that time we were getting threatening letters from uh, Sean Gallagher's attorney explaining that we could not use the words um, that we were practicing or teaching um, Pilates or Pilates technique. Um, next uh, page, please, of this brochure. So you can see that the program on day one involved presentations from Ron Fletcher, um, followed by a presentation from James Garrick, MD, uh, followed by a presentation of, of Ron Fletcher. And that the next day, Eve Gentry was giving a presentation followed by uh, Ken Endelman's presentation about um, Pilates um, apparatus, the development uh, from Joe's blueprints. And then the director of physical therapy at St. Francis Hospital, Chris Capra Fitzsimmons was speaking about physical therapy for dancers. So it's quite remarkable that in less than 20 years of uh, following Joe's death, um, when he was speaking with, uh, in 1967, he was speaking with John Steele about his frustrations that his work was not embraced by orthopedists and by physicians, that within 20 years, a, a hospital in downtown San Francisco would have a, a whole division that was uh, based on the groundbreaking, the pioneering work of Joseph Pilates, and that, that it brought um, uh, this this hospital served as a, the dance medicine Pilates area served as a, a focal point where um, 
where the second, uh, the first generation teachers, those trained by Joseph Pilates would have a forum um, in a major hospital. Next slide. Here you see the rehabilitation prescription pad where you see in the X in the upper uh, left corner that, uh, that a patient could be evaluated and treated with a physical therapy evaluation and that they could have prescribed Pilates-based kinetic activities. Next slide. And here, this will take you back in the day to our price structure <laughs> in the, uh, in the um, early 90s. Um, these are kinetic activities and conditioning using apparatus based on the designs of Joseph Pilates, including the reformer, the trapeze table, uh, the combination chair, the high and low barrel, the resistance ring, and the mat. And you see that it was possible for physicians to prescribe um, the uh, kinetic activities based on the work of Joseph Pilates. This prescription um, would uh, involve a physical therapy evaluation. Um, then the Pilates, uh, the dance medicine specialists, the Pilates teachers would uh, follow the guidance from the physical therapy evaluation and um, would, would direct or would, would teach the movement sequences appropriate for the patient's or the client's condition or the diagnosis from their physician. Then in order to assure that the short and the long-term goals were indeed being realized and met by the program, then there would be a reevaluation at least every six weeks in order to determine um, whether the uh, client was appropriate to be discharged for their um, home exercise program practice or whether um, a, um, a modification of the program was to be designed based on the physical therapy re-evaluation. And the next slide. Yes, here you see a, um, a summary or a list of the dance medicine rehabilitation kinetic activities and conditioning um, protocols or the, uh, the, the, the conditions that we were prepared to address um, with the different programs that well, with the different movement sequences uh, that were guided by the physical therapy evaluations. And the next slide. Um, in order to be a part of the treatment team that was um, overseen by Dr. James Garrick um, and uh, the physical therapists, the dance medicine specialists, Pilates teachers, kept notes of a documentation of each patient's or client's session. And these notes followed the physical therapy soap note um, practices of subjective, objective, assessment, assessment, and plan. And um, you can see here that under the objective area of those SOAP notes, there were um, places where there was documentation of the reformer exercises, the trapeze exercises, uh, the chair, the mat, the ha half barrel, and the high barrel as well. Um, is, that the, is that the last slide, Hillary? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> so <laughs> there, you, there you've had a, um, a whirlwind tour uh, to appreciate that the, that the brilliance of Joseph Pilates' work that John Steele has so um, um, beautifully and dramatically uh, described, that that brings us um, into how Pilates could be um, uh, start its dissemination uh, through the uh, physical therapy practice and medical system. Fantastic. Hey, we're going to um, show, so this is the movement practice. So um, we ask everyone to stand up and you can feel this movement yourself. Uh, and Elizabeth's going to do it. And uh, we decided uh, we're sharing each month on our webinar, uh, one piece of the uh, assessment that's being used uh, by each of the authors in the book. 
based on uh, gait. So um, this, this month, we wanted to focus on the hip joint um, mobility and how the pelvis moves since that's um, very important to gait. So in standing up, you can just place your hands on the front of your groin here where you think your head of your femur is here just to feel and have your feet right under your hip joints here. And then just notice at first, and don't change anything, just notice, uh, do you have more weight on one foot than the other? We tend to favor, like, you were, like Joe was saying, one person's stride was longer on one side and shorter on the other side. So you might notice that you might be standing and favoring a left foot or a right foot. And that means that you're in a little bit of a hip sway. So we're gonna sway our hips. So you, you just sway to your right and then sway to your left. Just make it very small. So your feet are staying flat on the floor and you're just doing a subtle shift through your feet. So just sway back and forth. And I want you to notice if you can feel when you sway to the right, how the right femur moves closer to your pubic bone. So you can touch your own pubic bone and notice how that femur comes in is towards adduction. And then as you sway to the left, the femur should also come in towards the midline. And then if you place your hands up on your pelvis on the top here, this is called the anominance here. So as you sway to the right, you'll notice maybe, and maybe it won't be there, a little bit of a drop of the left side of your pelvis, maybe five degrees maximum. It's just a slight little tilt. And if you sway to the left, that right side should just very subtly drop. And you'll notice one side you can feel the movement and the other side, maybe you don't feel the movement. So this is important to know, to be able to see where that restriction is. And with that, just also notice as you're swaying to the right, what is your rib cage doing? So is it moving with it? Is it going in the opposite direction? Are you rotating? There's all these possibilities uh, that someone can have. So as a viewer, you can come and I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to uh, come closer to the camera so we can take a look now as a teacher, we wanna be able to see this. You can feel it in your own body, right? So it's a great color. <laughs> We're matching blue today. <laughs> All right, so as she sways to the right, you can see how her pubic bone goes closer to her inner thigh there. Yeah, so the crease increases the inguinal ligament there. Yeah, and then as she sways to the left, right, we should see the pubic bone moving closer to the femur as well. So the inguinal ligament is increasing there. So what's happening is your pelvis is really balanced on these two balls. And so when you roll and you sway to the right, the femur on the right goes into adduction and the other one goes in abduction and then the hip should drop slightly. Yeah, so to the right, it would be the left side. Yeah, and then coming back through the center, the pelvis rights itself. And then as she sways to the left, there's a slight drop. That's beautiful, great movement of the right side. So this is a very important place uh, in our shifting of our weight uh, when we're gonna take a step so as we go from two feet and we start to step forward, there's this motion of the little bit of a sway happening and then the leg is going to swing and that pelvis has to have this slight little drop. So we have this, this little bit of a figure eight that goes on in the pelvis. And this is what you can notice when a client comes walking into your studio. It's probably, I don't know if Joe had that kind of detail though, uh, John did write in the book that, um, he, he uh, wrote the how well he knew anatomy. I remember reading that, that, that Joseph Pilates said that he, you asked him, John, how, how he developed his work. And then he said, it's because I know human anatomy. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, that's what he said. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, 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 I question, I, I think his knowledge was of a kind that's very rare. Uh, I he knew anatomy instinctively. He 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 claimed he read anatomy books as a child, which is absolutely uh, hard to believe. Uh, 
uh, <laughs> given the circumstances uh, of his life and the availability of anatomy books and all of that. Uh, and in all the years that I was with him, it wasn't that long, the few years I was with him, I, he never once used a anatomical term. Never once. It was your butt or your arm or your <laughs> elbow. Well, or that, that's how we talk to hip. our clients. <laughs> yeah, it, there was nothing. Yeah. So, uh, but he, he, he saw you as, and the other thing was about the anatomy. I think this is a very crucial point for you, for you and, if he had studied anatomy, it would have been static anatomy. What he was interested in is motion. What happens when you move? And that's where, that's where he, his diagnostic skills came out. He, he would see the motion like a, a motion picture or he, he'd see it as an, a moving x-ray. And as a consequence, uh, what, what did an anatomy book have to do with that? It was a picture of... Exactly. You know, so his, his sense of it was absolutely incredible. And I attributed it to the time he spent in Nakalu and on the Isle of Man in, mm -hmm. in a cell, thinking about his own body. He... he he just got in touch with it, which is what he wanted everyone else to do. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. Right. So um, we're going to move into, we have a few minutes, but like Elizabeth said, we'll, we'll go about 10 minutes after. Um, if anyone would like to ask any of us questions, um, you can write in the Q&A if you would. Um, if you have any questions for John or Elizabeth or myself. In the meantime, we don't have any questions at the moment, but I know it takes a moment to type in. So um, is there anything else you'd like to add, John? Um, well, Madeline, may, uh, just, just before we go into questions, and since we have this lull, um, um, could, uh, Hillary, would you put up the slide about uh, John's book? And then we can have okay. that information so people can uh, know where to find John's book. All right. There we go. There it is. Yes. So this is uh, the cover of John's book, The Caged Lion, Joseph Pilates and His Legacy. And uh, it's available either um, in uh, paperback, hardback, or Kindle. And you can order it from John's website, which will take you to Amazon or from um, Amazon. And uh, just to, uh, to mention um, before, before we go into, our, into the questions uh, that Madeline and I are thrilled to announce that our um, guest uh, next month um, when we have our um, Pilates Applications for Health Conditions webinar on July 15th, our guest will be Dr. Deirdre Mann, Doctor of Physical Therapy who also has a postdoctorate uh, certificate in movement science. And Deirdre Mann is the contributing author um, to our forthcoming book, Pilates Applications for Health Conditions. Deirdre Mann is contributing, is authoring the chapter on Pilates and breast cancer, which is um, uh, very significant, uh, given that Joseph Pilates and Eve Gentry work together um, to restore Eve Gentry's function following her radical mastectomy. Dr. Deirdre Mann will also speak about uh, Pilates applications in, for women's health and uh, very significantly now talk about Pilates applications for people of color. So that's to look forward to. And here we go we with have the question. Questions. Yeah, from Teresa, John. Do you still practice Pilates? Yes, I do. I I, I do. I still uh, uh, take reformer classes uh, when you know when studios were open. I I took uh, classes uh, twice a week, 
uh, sometimes in, in, in a class, sometimes privately, sometimes duets uh, with my wife, and sometimes duets with other people. Yes, and I have a chair at home. Uh, I have a reformer at a house in uh, France, and I have a, the springboard and magic circle and a few other little gadgets acquired over the years. Yes, it's very, very important to me still. So um, Barry asked uh, an interesting question. Uh, it's probably more for you and me, Elizabeth. And I was just gonna ask Barry, um, what specifically about the exercises that he did not have available um, what, so the question is, what key discoveries from current research do you feel might better explain the effectiveness of the movement exercises that Joe Pilates probably did not have available? Do you want to speak to that, Elizabeth? Would love to. Thank you for the opportunity. And Barry, thank you so much for the, for the question. Um, it's just amazing that uh, Joseph Pilates was intuitively uh, so wise and so well ahead of his time um, and so self-educated that he didn't have access to the current research on the neuromyofascial system, the research that's coming uh, from, the, uh, from the Fascia Research Society, um, et cetera. And neither did Joseph Pilates have access to the, uh, to the research, to the theory of biotensegrity, which is a, a very new science um, that's really, the term was only coined after Joseph Pilates' death. The term was, uh, the tensegrity became um, uh, a term in the 1970s, the late 60s and early 70s. And now as biotensegrity um, can explain uh, very beautifully, um, the efficacy of the Joseph Pilates work. Excellent. Um, we have a question for you, John. Um, they're curious if John had any experience with Clara as well, and how Joseph and Clara shared their work within their clients. Uh, great question. A lot of that in the book. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, uh, Clara uh it invited me i guess i was there about six months or so v very strangely uh, invited me to come over uh after work uh, for just to sit around in the apartment and uh, that took uh, like everything else at this stage <laughs> with Joe took me completely by surprise uh, she had said very few words to me and in, in, uh, in up to then, uh, and she invited me on behalf of Joe, which may be a European thing, I don't know. But at any rate, I did go, and from that, uh, from that, I I went regularly, and I explain why in the book, and uh, was there once a week at least, and uh, spent time with both of them. Uh, the uh, second part of that question, you know, Clara's relationship to the work and all that, it, it's not clear. It, well, certain things are very clear. It, Joe was everything. And, uh, you know, the pictures you see of Clara in a nurse's outfit, and white shoes and white stockings, everything but the little cap on her on head was very accurate. And that was what she was. She was uh, an assistant. Uh, she was there to do things. I never once saw her uh, work, do any work on, on Pilates equipment or do it, but she knew it cold. And after Joe died, I, I became very uh, uh, close to her in many ways. We, we, we and a few others that were taking care of her. And, uh, and I had dinner with her frequently. 
uh, she she didn't have much to do once Romana took over, and even uh, before Romana took over, uh, she had very little to do in the studio, m more than she did before. She didn't become, you know, like him at all, and uh, their relationship uh, hard to tell what, what it was really like. I I can't tell. I mean. He, he was, he took all the light and the air and everything out of the room. I mean, there was nothing left for anyone. And, uh, and she was just, you know, part of that. I, I, I try to visualize my relationship and to that, to try to jump from me to her and see what it was like for her. I have no idea. I have no idea. They were a team. They were a fantastic team. But, you know, teams are all very different. I, I can't answer the I'd love to be able to answer the question. I, I didn't think about it at the time. Who, whoever thought I would write a book, whoever thought this would be what it is. Only Joe. He's the one that, you know, he thought what Elizabeth was just talking about. He knew this was going to happen, but none of the rest of us did. None of us. I mean, we kept good going uh, just for our own purposes. We wanted a gym. We wanted a place we could do his exercises. So, I, I, you know, I asked him a few questions about his past. He, he avoided them like the plague, but he avoided a million questions. He was great at not answering. Um, <laughs> I don't know the answer. Well, we have another question. It's from Lillian uh, from Brazil. Uh, she'd like to thank uh, to tell you that I'm very touched and thankful for watching this webinar. Uh, she says, I've worked with cancer patients in my studio. I wanted to know if John could see a client with any serious condition and how was it? I think I had uh, asked you that question, if you had yeah. seen anyone in the studio. And, um, <laughs> So, no, the answer is no, you didn't really. <laughs> no, I mean, I knew about Eve Gentry. Yeah, everyone mm -hmm. knew about Eve Gentry. Uh, uh, but I never saw her, I never saw Joe work with her in the studio. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's, Lillian, if you can, next month, it's going to be our next webinar. So I think you'll find that interesting with Dr. Deirdre Mann. So. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Madeline, I see that there's a comment in the chat um, from Michael Hall. Does Pilates work more on the tendons rather than muscle strength as tendon strength is more important to optimal health? Um, Michael Hall, I'd just uh, like to, uh, to mention that, that last week's webinar from the Fascia Research, um, no, this week's webinar from the Fascia <laughs> Research Society um, that, was, uh, that was recorded on... Um, it's coming up, being recorded tomorrow morning, Thursday morning. Um, we'll speak about uh, the importance of connective tissue strength and tendon strength. That's certainly um, a, an, an awareness uh, from, the, from fascia research uh, that's so significant for sports training and athletic training. Although Joseph Pilates didn't have access to the research uh, during the time that he was developing his work, uh, the uh, the emphasis on the eccentric control or the control throughout the range of motion, both concentric and eccentric, um, can indicate uh, some benefits to, uh, to the connective tissue strength, the tendon strength. Um, so we can look forward to bringing, um, to doing even better work of integrating uh, the more recent research uh, with the Pilates work. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I think there aren't any more questions. So thank you, John, for joining us. My pleasure. I, I, I so much fun. And, you know, these are fantastic, wonderful memories and a vital part of my life. So it's great to be able to pass it on. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Till next month. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.